Good morning, dear brothers and sisters in Christ. Last April, Pope Francis visited the church of St. Bartholomew, which is on an island in the Tiber River in the center of Rome. It's an ancient church, but it was Cardinal George's titular church, and today is Cardinal Supic's titular church. But Pope St. John Paul II, in the year 2000, designated that church in a very special way. He wanted it to be a shrine and a memorial to our modern martyrs, to all of those who have been persecuted for the faith. And he entrusted it to the San Egidio community. And there they have assembled relics and mementos from Africa, Asia, the Middle East, the Americas, Europe, they have dossiers on over 12,000 martyrs of the 20th century. They even exhibit the missile that Archbishop Romero was using when he was celebrating mass and murdered. We used to think of the first centuries of the church as the time of persecution. But today we are becoming more and more aware of the countless persecuted Christians in our own times. Today's Mass is offered for our persecuted brothers and sisters in these times, when, as a Supreme Knight said yesterday, there is a genocide against Christians taking place. As Bishop Habash of Our Lady of the Deliverance, Syria Catholic Church appealed to us, we must be a sign of hope and solidarity. The presence of the Syriac Patriarch, the Bishop of Aleppo, and other bishops representing our suffering brothers and sisters is a tribute to the work of the Knights of Columbus and a stark reminder of our responsibility for each other in the body of Christ. We've all heard that wonderful quote from Pope Paul VI where he declares that more than teachers, the world needs witnesses. Jesus sent his disciples into the world to announce the good news, but to do so primarily by the witness of their lives. Their faith was made visible by the coherence of their actions, by the courage of their convictions, and the selfless love that expresses itself in the spirit of sacrifice. Sometimes we forget that the Greek word for witness is martyr. In the early church, the martyrs were seen as the ideal of discipleship. Men and women so transformed by their faith and their love for God that they were prepared to suffer even death to be able to witness to the church's faith in the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Jesus tells us in the gospel that just as he is persecuted, we who are his disciples must expect persecution in our own lives. In today's Mass, we remember our modern-day martyrs, especially our brothers and sisters who are persecuted in the Middle East. In many parts of those lands that are the cradle of civilization and also of Christianity, today many Christians are being driven out, tortured, and murdered. In some countries where there were thriving Christian communities living in peace with their non-Christian neighbors, now only a remnant of the community of faith remains. Like the prayer from the book of Esther by, our enemies are bent on destroying us. We can also pray for those Christians whose lives in, are in peril by using the words of today's first reading, O Lord, do not silence the mouths of those who praise you. We see in the Acts of the Apostles how the Sanhedrin tried to silence Peter and John, but these apostles boldly proclaimed that they must obey God rather than men. Despite the beatings and the threats, these apostles proclaimed that it's impossible not to speak about what we have seen and heard. The same passage from Acts tells us that many of those who heard the word came to believe, and the number grew to 5,000. The blood of the martyrs is indeed 
the seed of the church, as Tertullian said. In the early church, there was such great devotion to the martyrs who gave their lives in the witness of the faith. In Rome, where Peter and Paul were martyred and thousands perished in the Colosseum, the persecuted Christians celebrated mass in the catacombs on the tombs of the martyrs, and hence our tradition of putting martyrs' relics in the altars where the Eucharist is celebrated. As the number of Christians, Catholic, Orthodox and others are suffering for their allegiance to Christ, Pope Francis often speaks eloquently about the ecumenism of blood. The Holy Father reminds us that our love for Christ and the Christian faith unites us closely with the Orthodox and other Christians who are shedding their blood in witness to the Christian faith. Two years ago, I was so moved by the news reports concerning the 21 men beheaded in Libya by the terrorists there. It was on February the 2nd, 2015, when 20 Egyptian construction workers who were Coptic Christians were told by their captives that they must renounce their Christian faith. When When they refused, they were marched out in orange jumpsuits and beheaded. While they were being murdered, they whispered prayers and the name of Jesus. There was one more captive in the group with them. He was a worker from Chad. He was not a Christian. But when the terrorists asked him if he were a Christian, he simply said, their God is my God. And the terrorists killed him too. Would that our fidelity and courage in the face of hardship and persecution would lead people to say of us, their God is our God. We have all been horrified by the spectacle of bombings in Catholic and other Christian churches in Egypt, Iraq, Nigeria, and India. The whole world laments the brutal murder in Yemen of three of Mother Teresa's missionaries of charity whose only crime was taking care of the elderly poor. The Holy Father is challenging us to strive to grow closer to our fellow Christians and to live that unity that Jesus prayed for when he said, by this will all know that you are my disciples if you have love one for another. August the 2nd, It's a very special day for me as a follower of St. Francis, for today is the Feast of the Portiuncula, Our Lady of the Angels. It's also the anniversary of my ordination that took place 33 years ago in the Virgin Islands of the West Indies. The Portiuncula is a tiny chapel in Assisi dedicated to Our Lady. St. Francis made it the principal church of the Franciscan family. Francis realized that Many people would love to go on a pilgrimage to the Holy Land, but because it was so far, so expensive, and so dangerous, few would be able to fulfill that dream. So St. Francis wanted to initiate the Portiuncula indulgence so that pilgrims could receive the same graces by visiting the chapel of Our Lady of the Angels in Assisi. Today, that privilege extends to all Franciscan churches and cathedrals all over the world. One of my earliest childhood recollections of observing this feast was going each year to the chapel of the Poor Clares with my grandmother. In the good old days, it was possible to gain as many plenary indulgences as you wanted. And the custom was to say the prescribed prayers in the chapel and then leave and come back and say the prayers again. There was always a column of Irish and Italians going in and out of the Port Clares Chapel. Each time we entered, my grandmother would announce which of our relatives we were getting out of purgatory. (laughs) After a while, I was getting very tired, and I said, Nana, I think we got him out last year. (laughs) To which my grandmother replied, that one needs a lot of prayers. The practice of the Portiuncula ties Catholics around the world to the idea of our connectedness to the Holy Land. St. Francis had such great love for the Holy Land, 
which grew out of his love for the humanity of Jesus Christ and his devotion to the Incarnation. It was that same devotion that led Francis to prepare the first creche so that people could see the poverty and the simplicity surrounding Jesus' birth. To this day, the Franciscan friars take care of the holy places in Palestine, the very first province that St. Francis founded in the order. They receive pilgrims from all over the world. In the eighth century since the friars have been there, hundreds and hundreds have been died as martyrs. During the fifth crusade, Francis himself went to Egypt to meet with the Sultan. A new documentary prepared by the Franciscan was, was shown recently in Boston at a mosque in Roxbury. The film is entitled In the Footprints of Francis and the Sultan, a model for peacemaking. Francis had a keen awareness of the fatherhood of God and to the point of seeing all creation as his brothers and sisters, brother Sun and sister Moon. Francis sees his vocation and that of his friars to be universal brothers, trying to overcome barriers and conflicts, to be instruments of peace. So when the forces of Christendom were intent on violently destroying the Muslim presence in the Holy Land, Francis of Assisi had a different approach. He wanted to have a dialogue with the Sultan, Malek al-Kalim, the nephew of the great Saladin. When Francis arrived at the Sultan's compound, accompanied by one friar, the Muslim soldiers allowed him to enter because they thought he was a harmless beggar. And of course, Muslims have an obligation to give alms to beggars. Francis managed to meet the Sultan and engaged in a long and friendly dialogue with him and his people. He actually spent several days there. St. Bonaventure describes the encounter in his biography of St. Francis. And when Francis departed, the Sultan gave him an ivory horn that had been used by the Muslims to call people to prayer. Francis took it back to Assisi and used it to call the friars to prayer, and it can still be seen on display there. I dare say if more Christians had had the attitude of St. Francis, we would not be facing the terrible violence spawned by the radical jihadists of today. A few years ago, a beautiful film was produced in France called Des Hommes et des Dieux, of gods and men. The film recounts the history of nine Trappist monks in a monastery in Algeria where they provided medical and pastoral care to the local population. They developed a very close relationship with their Muslim neighbors. The monks decided not to flee in the face of encroaching fundamentalism, but rather to stay among the poor where they had been serving. The monks were captured and murdered. The film concludes with the spiritual testament of the abbot in the form of a letter that he wrote to his brother back in France. In the letter, Father Chrétien tells his brother that he's prepared to die, but what worries him most of all is that many people will use his death as an excuse to hate Muslims. Like this holy Trappist, and indeed like St. Francis, we do not want the suffering of our Christian martyrs to be an excuse for our pretext to hate Muslims. We want to see the death of our martyrs as a sign of love and a witness of the faith and the resurrection that can truly be a seed of our religion. Gandhi once said, if I had ever known a Christian, I would have become one. We must show the world the loving and the merciful face of Christ by living lives of discipleship that are coherent with the gospel and that contribute to the building up of the civilization of love. Centuries of misunderstanding, bigotry, persecution, and hatred have produced the horrendous situation that we face today. We must work diligently for a world where prejudice and hatred are changed by a spirit of dialogue and solidarity, where each and every person is valued as a child of God. Part of faithful discipleship is being focused on the suffering 
of so many persecuted Christians. Too often we're like the priest and Levite in the parable of the Good Samaritan who seemed to be oblivious to the suffering of his brother. We are all grateful to the Knights of Columbus for their ongoing and generous commitment to aid the suffering Christian brothers and sisters whose lives and communities are in shambles. Today's gospel reminds us that Christ promises happiness to those who are persecuted. Our reaction to martyrdom cannot be one of despair, but rather of hope. The Beatitudes and the teachings of the Sermon on the Mount are the ideals that must inspire us each day. Jesus' Beatitudes represent a reversal of values and indeed turn the world's standards for happiness upside down. Jesus challenges us as disciples to see life through God's eyes. These same Beatitudes are a portrait of Christ's own life, Jesus as poor, meek, merciful, peacemaker, pure of heart, and persecuted. Jesus teaches us that happiness is not achieved through money, pleasure, and power. True happiness comes through a life of love and sacrifice, happiness born of making a gift of ourselves to God and to others. This is precisely what our martyred brothers and sisters have done. They have laid down their life for God and for their love of us. As Jesus has shared with us, greater love has no one than the one who lays down their lives for their family and their brothers, their friends, their community. May the courage and fidelity of this cloud of witnesses help us to be more faithful Christians, to be more authentic, to be true missionary disciples whose lives and values betoken the joy of the gospel.